So the angle of twist. If the shaft is fixed at one end and subject to a constant torque uh, across its length, a previous, previously undeformed plane, which is that kind of a dark greenish, bluish uh, plane shown there, uh, will distort as shown into the lighter gray plane. What we can see is that the radial line uh, remains a radial line, but it has rotated after the torque is applied through an angle phi, and we see it marked on here as phi at x. This angle phi is referred to as the angle of twist. Note that it is a function of the distance x from the support, and it gets larger as the distance x increases, as we can see here on the diagram. In considering the effects of torsion, let's look at a prismatic bar loaded with a constant torque T over its length. We will consider an infinitesimally thin slice of the bar, dx, a distance x from the support. And for the next little while, this is that little thin slice is where we're going to focus our efforts. We'll first start to talk about the deformations resulting from torsion. So here is our infinitesimally thin slice of our prismatically loaded, loaded bar. Uh, and so we see it has a radius of C and it is a length of dx. We're going to consider some other radius rho. So the radius that you are out along the bar uh, will be indicated by rho. And we're going to be some value of rho between zero and its maximum at C. Now, one of the things that we saw when we looked at that uh, rubber bar early on was that a surface that was rectangular prior to um, deformation forms a parallelogram after deformation. So let's see if we can look at this more closely. So we have the plane A, B, O, where O is the origin uh, or the along the longitudinal axis, uh, and A, B are on the, this surface a distance rho from uh, the uh, longitudinal axis. And I've drawn in the plane, uh, the plane or that rectangle in brown to re reflect that. And then prior, or that, so that is prior to the torque being applied. After the torque is applied, it will deform by our angle of twist, and that previously rectangular uh, surface will now become a parallelogram. So the new line is identified as a B prime instead of a B. So the material is distorted by a shear strain gamma. We know this because that rectangular section, which is now a parallelogram, is exactly like what we saw when we were looking at shear stresses and shear strains in the previous section. And the shear strain is the change in the angle. So let's see if we can relate these a little bit. So if we look at the distance BB prime, that BB prime can be calculated in two different, from two different sides. We can take the angle of shear strain gamma and multiply it by the length dx and that should give us the distance bb prime. Likewise, if we take the angle d theta and multiply it by the distance rho, that should also give us the, uh, the distance bb prime. And thus we get the equation which is on this slide. The distance bb prime is both equal to rho d theta and dx gamma. And thus we relate d theta and gamma. Let's rearrange that a little bit, make it a little bit more palatable or useful to us. And so we get the shear strain is equal to our radius rho uh, times d theta by dx. Now, one thing we know is that d theta by dx is a constant. And thus, if we look at this, gamma will vary uh, with, from zero. Uh, if we were on the longitudinal axis or rho was equal to zero, the uh, gamma would be equal to zero. Uh, and gamma or the shear strain would be a maximum where rho is a maximum, which would be where rho is equal to C. And so we see that uh, d theta by dx is equal to 
rho divided by gamma, or if we substitute in the maximum values, we'll reach a maximum shear strain uh, when rho is equal to c. We can also rearrange this to say that gamma, or the shear strain, is equal to the ratio rho over c multiplied by the, the maximum shear strain which occurs in the section. So rho over c, think of it, rho is a value from the uh, longitudinal axis out to a value of c when it gets to the extreme fiber on the outside. And so this is a ratio, rho over c is a ratio between zero and one. And so we're getting this linear variance of the shear strain, uh, zero at the center and a maximum at the outside. So what about shear stress? So we've talked a little bit about shear strain and doing things a little bit backwards uh, or in reverse order than the last time. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about shear stress. So we have our slice dx. Uh, we have a internal torque applied on its face. And of course, we're talking a distance rho, uh, absolute radius uh, of the section is C. So we know from the previous slide that our shear strain is equal to this ratio rho over C multiplied by gamma max. Now we also know Hooke's law for shear. Uh, remember that the shear stress is equal to the shear modulus multiplied by the shear strain. And we can substitute that in to know that the shear stress is equal to that ratio, rho to C, multiplied by our maximum shear stress. So what does that tell us? It tells us that our shear stresses will also vary linearly with the radius from zero at the center to a maximum on the outside. And we see that shown pictorially here on the diagram. So remember that stress and strain occur at a point. So let's look at a point. Consider the differential element uh, at radius rho, and we've drawn it in here as dA on that face. Let's draw it out in a larger format off to the side. So we are a distance rho, we have dA represented here, and we have our shear stress indicated as uh, tau at rho uh, on that face. Now remember when we looked at shear stresses, we determined that all the in-plane shear stresses on the differential element had to be equal in magnitude and facing uh, opposite edges uh, of the element. So we know that there are three other accompanying shear stresses of equal magnitude to tau at rho. So all we have to do is identify the plane and we know where those in-plane shear stresses are. So let's draw out our uh, differential element in three dimensions and we, it becomes much easier to see where those in-plane shear stresses would occur for this one that we've calculated. And we'll draw them in here. So this is particularly interesting because now we can see that e because we have shear stresses manifesting them manifesting themselves the way they do on this face, that they are also have uh, caused shear stresses longitudinally in the shaft. And that's why, or that, that would explain why we can see things like if we take a wooden shaft, which has weak planes between the fibers uh, in the wood, that if you put a, tor a torque on it, that quite often what you'll see is it will split longitudinally as a result of the in-plane shear stresses caused by the um, shear stresses caused by torsion. So let's see if we can't get a formula that will allow us to calculate our shear stresses resulting from our uh, internal torque T. So we have our cross section, a radius C, and our torque, internal torque applied, T. And we know that the shear stresses resulting from that torque will vary linearly from the center out to the maximum at the outer edge. So if we consider a differential element dA, a distance rho uh, from the center, 
and on it will be our shear stress tau at rho. So from the previous slide, we know that tau is equal to uh, the ratio rho to c multiplied by our maximum shear stress, and we'll call that equation one. So in order to get t, we know that we, all we have to do is integrate our uh, stresses over the area. Now, because this is a torque, we actually have to integrate our forces, the, the stresses multiplied by the area over which they apply, multiplied by the moment arm to get a, turn it into a torque. And when we do that, it must be equal to the internal torque T. So if we look at this, we have our uh, shear stress tau multiplied by the area over which it's applied, dA. So that becomes a force multiplied by its moment arm, because we're doing torques about the central axis. So that would be rho. And if we integrate that over the area, it has to be equal to the torque T. So we look at that, we substitute uh, from one. So we substitute in for torque from one, we get our ratio rho to C times set tau max. And since tau max uh, divided by C is constant, we can take them outside the integral. And we have a definition now. So our uh, what's left in the integral sign, the integral over the area of rho squared dA is a geometric property. It is solely a property of the geometry of the cross section. And so it, it is appropriate that we would have a cross-sectional property that uh, reflects that. And so we call that the polar moment of inertia. We denote it as J. By definition, it is equal to the integral over the area of rho squared dA. And so that simplifies our equation to say that uh, our maximum shear stress or tau max is equal to our internal torque multiplied by uh, the radius C all divided by the polar moment of inertia J. Now we can combine one and two and make that equal to tau is equal to uh, T rho over J, which is our, our pretty much our, our master formula for shear stresses resulting from torsion. So just to, to look at it a little bit, so we have our torque, internal torque applied, always internal torque taken from your torque force diagram, multiplied by your distance from the longitudinal axis, so your distance out, uh, divided by the polar moment of inertia. If you're interested in the maximum, then you would just substitute in C for rho, and you would get TC over J, and you would have tau max. So now that we've defined the polar moment of inertia, it probably behooves us to very quickly look at what it would be for a circular shaft. So we have our uh, cross section with a radius C, and we're going to consider uh, this area slice identified as D rho. And so J is equal to, by definition, remember the integral over the area of rho squared dA. So if we put the integral out between zero and C, uh, we can do that if we substitute in uh, for dA, two pi rho d rho. And we can take our two pi outside the integral. That leaves us the integral from zero to C of rho cubed d rho. We do our integral substitute in for zero and C, and we end up with two pi rho to the fourth over four from zero to C. And that gives us a polar moment of inertia for the circular cross section of pi over two times the radius all to the power of four. Similarly, for a tubular cross section, we can derive that the polar moment of inertia is equal to pi over two all times the outer radius to the fourth minus the inner radius to the fourth. These values, not expected to memorize them or derive them in the future, but they are found in the geometric properties on the front flyleaf of your textbook. And you can draw those, that, that information from there whenever we're working on a problem. So with that, we have the tools to start to look at shear stresses in a shaft loaded with torsion. And so we have the same shaft uh, that we had before. 
so we're just going to build on the same problem through a series of, of examples. And so you already have done the free body diagram, derived the reaction, and come up with the torque force diagram. So torque force diagram shown here. And so that's the starting point for this solved problem. And so this problem will go on and look at this and for both a solid and a hollow section, uh, derive the maximum shear stresses for both of those conditions and have a little conversation about which one is larger and which one is more efficient.